Here's our Oslo Designer, episode 230, Farming Out Design Work. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now your host. He went through a phase where his entire wardrobe was black. Mark Dickout. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy that you've decided to tune in and listen today. And yes, as Wayne said, I did go through a period of my life Part of my late teens where my entire wardrobe, every bit of clothing I had was black. Some of it had some graphics on it, uh, like band t-shirts and that, but it had to be black. I can tell you my mom hated it. And boy, was she happy when I finally started introducing some color into my wardrobe. But that's not why you're here today. You're tuning in because today I'm talking about farming out design work. When you have jobs and you have to hire other designers to help you with them. And I'm also going to share a tip that may help you financially. But before I get to all of that, here's a little bit of what I've been up to. If you listen to the podcast every week as it's released, you may have noticed that I did not release an episode last week. If you're listening to this in the future and you just finished hearing the previous one, then this is no big deal for you. But last week, time just got the better of me. Actually, I was working on a website. Uh, I, I normally record the podcasts Friday afternoons. And Friday morning, I got working on a website. You know how it is. You get in the zone. Everything is just going right. And that's where I was. And I just didn't want to stop for the podcast. So in my mind, I thought, well, we're not doing anything on the weekend. I'll just record on the weekend. And of course, I'm not used to recording on the weekend. So when Saturday rolled around, I completely forgot until I was actually in bed Saturday evening. And I thought, oh, wow, I really have to do the podcast tomorrow. And then, of course, on Sunday, we were doing some stuff. We had some family come over. And before I knew it, I completely forgot. So there was no episode last week. But as for design work, I've been doing a lot of web work this past week. As I said, I was in the zone last Friday working on something. Got a couple of different websites on the go for podcast clients. Even the one that I mentioned previously, where it's the the first time I've had to build a website on WordPress.com. Give you a little heads up there. With the WordPress.com business plan, Divi that I installed is working flawlessly. Uh, Or I say flawlessly, there is one little flaw that bugs me. And that's if you're familiar with Divi. I often like to work on the front end, the visual builder. Well, you can do that fine on WordPress.com. The only issue is, is there's no button to leave the visual builder. So once you save the page, there's no way to get out of it that I can find at least other than closing the page and reopening a new one in the back end of WordPress. But it looks like I'm not going to have to deal with that very much longer because the client that I had on WordPress.com She sent me an email earlier today saying that she's talked to a few people and they told her that she really should be building her WordPress on a hosted platform with a a copy of WordPress on it and not on the WordPress.com website, which happens to be the exact same advice I gave her when she asked me to consult with her. But for some reason, she didn't want to take my advice. But now after talking to some other people, she's decided that she is going to move her website to a hosting platform. And she asked for my advice on that. I suggested SiteGround. I gave her my affiliate link. So I make a small commission off of that when she signed up. And now I'm going to move her website. I'm going to migrate it over from WordPress.com to SiteGround built on WordPress, which will make it a lot easier for me. Plus, I can install some things and just do a few things that you couldn't do on WordPress.com, which was very little. By the way, if you're interested in website hosting, I do recommend SiteGround. I've been with them for several years now, and I've been recommending them for a while. I love them. Their customer support is top tier. Anytime I've had an issue, which is very few and far between, they've always come through for me. Now, if you're interested, you can visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash SiteGround. That is my affiliate link. And if you do sign up, I do get a small commission on the sale. But that website's coming along nicely and some other websites. I don't have any print jobs on the go right now, which is a little interesting. Everything is digital work, but I am loving it. And just trying to stay on top of everything. There's a lot of stuff coming in right now, but I'm not complaining. So that's a little bit of what I've been up to this past week. Now, I want to share a tip of the week with you. And this week is something that Brian 
in the resourceful designer community brought to our attention or, or shared with us, I should say, that I thought, wow, I should really share this with the community as a great tip. Brian, you may correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but Brian was looking at updating or upgrading his web hosting. He does a lot of work with clients and all that. And he contacted his hosts. And if I remember correctly, what he said is he negotiated with his host and he ended up getting a better plan, but at a smaller rate than what he had been paying before. So he ended up paying less or going forward, he's going to pay less on a monthly basis, but he's going to have more uh, storage or, or a bigger plan than what he had before. And this got Brian on a little bit of a kick and he said he actually made a game of it. He decided that he wanted to save $2,000 per year. So he started going through all his subscriptions, all the, the software he has, all his licenses, everything that he has that he pays on a regular basis, just to see how much he can cut out in order to save $2,000 per year. And Brian announced in the resourceful designer community that he made his goal. Through cutting a little bit here and a little bit there, he was able to save $2,000 per year. And I thought, wow, that was really interesting. And I'm sure that a lot of people in the community would love to hear about this. Now, just my situation, and this isn't because I was trying to follow what Brian did, but just in my situation, this past month, I told you before how I was having internet problems. Well, I decided to switch internet carriers. Actually, I had my television and internet on one company and my phone on another company. Well, I switched everything to the company where my phone was. And in the process, through the bundles, I'm actually saving $80 per month. Then yesterday, uh, or earlier this week, my wife, something happened with her cellular phone. It's, it's not working properly. And uh, she had an iPhone 7 Plus. And instead of paying to get it repaired because it would cost too much, we started looking into a new phone for her. And it turns out that through our current carrier, because we've been with them for a while, she had some discounts and some stuff through the loyalty program. So long story short, we were able to get her a brand new iPhone 11 that has double the amount of data that's shareable among our family that we had before, and it's costing us $3 less per month than what we had been paying. So it's not a big saving, it's only $3, but still, these things start to add up. Then I had another software that I got notice from yesterday, I got an email saying that this software that I pay, it's to help with my podcast, both Resourceful Designer and my television show podcast that I do. And that service is $55 a year. But then I thought, I remember hearing something, some community that I just joined, it's a membership community I joined. Part of that membership is a free subscription to this service. So I looked into it and sure enough, as a member of that community, I was able to downgrade my plan to from the paid $55 a year to a free plan, which normally the free plan is, is very limited. But because I'm a member of this community, the free plan actually bumps me up one tier. So I'm basically getting the exact same service I was paying $55 a year for, but now I don't have to pay for it because I'm part of this community. And then something else I did this week is I'm a member of Audible, where I get audiobooks. And when you're a member of Audible, you get a free credit every month for a free book. Well, I have a lot of books. I'm behind on my book reading or book listening, I guess you can say. And I started stockpiling credits. Well, Audible, once per year, allows you to put your membership on hold for three months. So the $14.95 that I pay per month in order to get these audiobooks, I was able to put it on hold. I gave him a call and I said, could I put it on hold for three months, which saves me $44.85. So when you start adding these things up, switching my internet over, my wife's phone, this other service that I'm now getting for free, and Audible, just that alone saved me $1,095.85 this year, or over the next 12 months, I should say. So it's very, very easy to do. As Brian said, he made a game out of it to try to see, and he was like cutting pennies here and a dollar or two here in order to get it to that $2,000. So why don't you look into your expenses? What are you paying for right now that maybe you can cut back on to save some money? And it might not sound like much when you say, well, it's only a dollar here or a dollar there per month. But when you add it all up, it can be quite a lot. What could you do with an extra $2,000 per year? Can you take a trip? Can you do some minor home renovations? Maybe buy a barbecue for the backyard? Put a down payment on a car? Who knows? 
but I'm sure you can use the extra money. So why don't you look at your expenses, what you're paying for right now, and see where you can cut back, even if it's just a little bit at a time. And sometimes that means contacting your cable company or your internet provider or your web host and just seeing, is there any way you can cut back on what you're paying? So I thought that what Brian was sharing there was very interesting, and I thought I would share it with you as a tip of the week. Now, speaking of tip, there are plenty of them in the Resourceful Designer community. And uh, let me say that I'm very, very thankful that the Resourceful Designer community is not one of the expenses that Brian decided to cut in order to reach his goal of 2000 per year. In fact, Brian told me that it's one of the most valuable things he is investing in his business right now. In fact, there's a few people that have told me that in the community recently, that out of all their expenses they have for their business, they view the resourceful designer community as one of their most valuable expenses. And I don't mean that as most expensive. I mean most valuable as in they get the most value out of the expense. So that was really nice to hear because I'm really proud of this community. We have a great bunch in the community. Today we had our weekly video roundup. And there was quite a few. I think there was eight people that joined today, which is a good number for video chat from the community. We had eight people on the call today just talking about our week and how everything was going and what sort of work we've been doing. And it was really nice to catch up. And sometimes that's all you need. You just need that ability to connect with people who are not friends or clients and that, but people who are peers, people who are other designers and that understand where you are, what you're doing. And just connect with them. And I know we started this weekly video chat in the community as part of the COVID lockdown because we were doing it on a monthly basis before. It was a monthly video chat. And I went to weekly when COVID hit. But now I can't imagine not doing it weekly. I love interacting with these people and I love connecting with them on a week to week basis, finding out what they're up to, what they're doing, how we can all help each other. And that's what this community is all about. So if you are looking for something like this, something to help out your design business, and maybe something that you will consider a very valuable resource as well, then why not consider joining the Resourceful Designer community at resourcefuldesigner.com slash community. And now, farming out design work. The idea for this episode was actually born from a post in the Resourceful Designer Facebook group. And I think the easiest thing to do is to give you a little bit of backstory by reading the original post. So this was a post by Rihanna, uh, and she posted this at the beginning of September, and she said, Hi guys, so I'm turning away a lot of work at the moment, as I have my day job and seem to have very little energy in the evenings and weekends to take on many freelance jobs. Seriously, I'm feeling so burned out, have been for a while now. I do the odd freelance job here and there for previous clients that I'm friendly with, but I still get a lot of requests, despite not advertising or putting any vibes out that I'm available. I usually just recommend one or two other designers, and they really appreciate the work coming their way. But I also sometimes wonder, if I'm being too kind, would this be reciprocated? Could I charge a percentage from the jobs I recommend? Would outsourcing them take too much energy if I still need to be the person in between the client and the designer? Has anyone been in a similar situation? Now that was Rihanna's post, but I'm sure that she's not the only one in this situation where you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Maybe you're only running your job part-time or you're, you're freelancing as some call it. I don't like that term, but that's what a lot of people call it. But maybe you're in a situation like that where you have so much work that you're not sure what to do with it. Now, first off, Rihanna, congratulations. There are many, many designers out there that would just love to keep getting requests for work coming in without having to reach out. So that just goes to show that you are good at what you do if people keep coming to you like this, even when you're not trying. But that's not the issue here. The issue is that you don't have the time or the energy to take on all this incoming work. Now, of course, there are many different ideas and many opinions out there on how to handle situations like this. And all I can do is share what I know, what I think, and my experiences. So maybe others may disagree with what I have to say, but here's my take on it. So let me start off by saying, and I've said this before on the podcast, if you're a designer and you find yourself overwhelmed with too much work, chances are you're not charging enough for your services. 
It's the same actually for any industry, not just the design industry. Too much work coming in is a sure sign that your prices are too low. So my first suggestion in a situation like this is to raise your rates. Not only will raising your design rates reduce the number of inquiries that you get, but those inquiries that do come in, they'll be from much higher quality clients. Now, I know this from experience. The more I charge, the better the clients I get to work with. When I first started and I was charging $50 an hour, I had all sorts of clients. And a lot of them, they just wanted me to do what they had in their head and nothing more. They just wanted a, what I like to call a pixel pusher. You know, They would dictate what I had to do. But then as I started raising my rates over the years, the higher my prices got, the more freedom the clients gave me, the more clients trusted me, the more they valued my opinion. And that's the same across the board. Talk to any designer. The more you charge, the better quality of clients you end up working with. Now, I know that raising your prices can be a very scary thing to do. I've talked about that in past episodes of the podcast. And anytime this topic is brought up, a lot of people will think, well, what will my current clients think? Will they leave me? Will people stop referring me if I charge more? Will this influx of new work that keeps coming in dry up? Well, in my personal experience and from talking with others, the answer to all these questions is nothing drastic is going to happen other than you're going to end up making more money. Now, there is a possibility that you lose a couple of clients, although in most cases, I know in my case, I didn't really lose any. But if you happen to lose any, the increase in income from those who stay usually more than make up for the loss of the ones that leave. Plus, if a few of them do leave you, that just means you have more time on your hand to devote to the projects that you do have, which means because you have more time, you'll probably end up doing a better job at it. And if you do a better job, they're worthy of the higher prices. These clients are going to refer you because you did such a good job, and then you're going to end up getting better clients. So, of course, that's my first thought. When you're busy, raise your prices. But in Rihanna's case, by the sound of it, that's not the problem here. Rihanna doesn't have the time to take on the work coming in because she's working a full-time job and she's only doing this in the evenings and the weekends. She's okay to take on a few projects here and there, but there's much more than she can handle. So yes, raising your rates may fix this problem, but it might not be the perfect solution right now. Now, ideally, in a perfect world, what I would say is if you have so much work coming in that you can't handle it, it might be time to actually quit your day job and concentrate full time on your design business. But I don't know your personal situation. I don't know if that's feasible at this time. So that might not be a solution right now. So what do you do when you can't quit that day job and you have too much work coming in for the amount of time that you have to devote to it? Well, you can do like Rihanna does and just pass it on to other designers, or you can get help. Now, it's nice to pass the work along to other designers. You're doing them a favor. But as you said in your post, Rihanna, they may appreciate the work coming their way, but that doesn't help you at all. In fact, if I use this expression, it's like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Once you pass on a client to somebody else, another designer, there's almost zero chance that that client will ever come back to you in the future. Why would they? And of course, there's no guarantee that this other designer will ever do the same to send work your way. After all, if you're too busy that you're sending work to them, why are they going to send work back to you if they think, well, you're so busy, you wouldn't be able to handle it anyways? And chances are, most designers don't want to hand off work. I know I don't like handing off work if I can hold on to it. Plus, if you're sending clients to other designers, what happens if a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, you decide to open up your own business full time? You do finally leave your job and you go into business for yourself, running your own design business. All those clients that you passed on, you lost out on them. They're not going to come back to you. And they could have been a great base to start your business on. Now, I personally have never been a fan of the referral system for designers either through fees or commissions or any sort of thing like that, it requires too much trust by both parties, in my opinion, and it seldom works out. I mean, what happens if a client comes to you and say, I'm looking for a designer that can create a logo for my business? 
and you say, well, I'm going to pass this on to this other designer and whatever, you charge a fee or a commission. Well, what happens if once the other designer designs the logo, the client says, I love it. Now, are you going to do a business card and a brochure and all that too? What about a website? And gets the designer to do all this stuff. Do you get a referral fee for that stuff or only for the logo? Do you get a percentage of that? And all that stuff. It's just too complicated. At least that's my thought on it. It's too complicated. You have to trust that the other designer will be forthcoming and let you know. And do you want to stay on top of it and see what the other designer is doing all the time? It's just not worth it. So what I suggest is for any clients whose project sounds interesting, this is not for the clients who come to you with a project and you go, oh, I really don't know. Okay, I can pass this on to somebody else. In fact, if it's a project that I would go, ugh, you know what the type of project I'm talking about, the one that you get and just, ugh, no, oh, no. Well, are you actually doing a service by passing this on to another designer you know? In most cases, I would just tell the client, it's like, sorry, I'm not able to work on that and let them go. Let them find somebody else. So do the same with any client who comes your way with a project that's not too interesting. You just politely decline the project. But if it's a project that does sound interesting, but you don't have the time to work on it, don't pass it on to another designer. Instead, farm the project out. Now, this is basically what I replied to Rihanna in the Facebook group. Instead of passing on work to other designers, you should act as the quote-unquote art director and get other designers to do the work for you. This way, you get to retain the client. They're your client. You make some money, but you don't have to devote all that necessary time to designing the actual work for the client. It actually becomes a win-win-win, I guess, for everybody. The client gets a great job. The designer is happy because they've got paid for some work. And you're happy because you still have this client and you got a little bit of money from it without putting out too much time. But how do you go about farming out design work? Well, of course, the first thing you have to do is find designers who can handle the work for you. Now, these may be the current designers you already know. Maybe these ones that you're sending stuff to, you can hire them instead to work for you as freelancers. And if that's not feasible, there are lots of other places you can find designers to work with. Many platforms online, such as Upwork.com, toptal.com, peopleperhour.com, freelancer.com, workhopper.com, guru.com. And that's just to name a few. And yes, even Fiverr. There, I said it. I know, I know, Fiverr. But I admit, even I've hired people on Fiverr before. Depending on what you're looking for, there are viable people on Fiverr and all these other platforms that you can hire. And of course, there are many other platforms that you can search as well for design talent. Then once you find somebody, you go through their portfolio, you decide that they are capable of doing the job, then what you do is you act as the go-between between the client and the designer. So what you do is you talk to the client, you figure out what the client needs. If you have to, you do some discovery process with the client. Maybe come up with some rough ideas yourself. I mean, you are a designer after all. You just inadvertently talking to a client. I know if you're like me, as soon as I start talking to a client, in my mind, I'm already designing stuff. I'm coming up with ideas, concepts, mock-ups, and all that sort of stuff. So maybe what you can do is you come up with rough ideas, and then you pass that on to the designer for them to clean up or to come up with their own ideas based on what you presented them. Now, in some cases, depending on who you're working with, you may want to give the designer full creative freedom. Just tell them verbally what you want, the idea behind everything, and let them be creative in their own way and come up with an idea. They may surprise you. Or in other cases, as I said, you may want to dictate exactly what they should do. Now, of course, that will all depend on a job-by-job basis. Some jobs you may be able to give them freedom and some jobs no. And it may depend on the client itself. Then the designer you hire does all the work, gives the project back to you, and then you present it to the client. And of course, you act as the go-between. If the client wants some revisions, then you go back to the designer and ask for revisions. You present it to the client and you do this until the client is satisfied. Now, if you do this, for example, you could take a 10-hour design project. I don't know, maybe it's a brochure, a logo, a website, whatever. Let's say a 10-hour design project. You could handle this because it'll only take maybe one hour of your time. And if you do, say, four of these projects per week, 
four 10-hour projects. That means you can bill the clients for 40 hours worth of design work, but you are only putting in four hours a week yourself. Hmm. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Ferriss who even wrote a book that kind of outlines this concept called the four-hour work week, where you can use other people to your advantage to get the work done so that you don't have to spend as much time doing it yourself. And then once the project's done, you bill the client and you pay the designer and you keep the difference for yourself. And in most cases, the amount you keep, the money that you earn by doing this, is actually more than what you would have earned from the time you put in if you had done the work yourself. What I mean by this is if it's a 10-hour project and you only have to put in one hour and let the designer do the other nine hours of work and then you present to the client, whatever you collect, your commission, would be worth more than one hours of your work. So for example, if you normally charge $100 per hour, well, when the whole thing is said and done, you might actually pocket $200 or $300, which is much more than you would have made during that one hour if you had actually been designing it. In fact, there are some designers that have gotten to the point where their entire business is built on this model. I know of designers who have stopped designing. They've been designing for many, many, many years, and now they barely ever design anymore. They're doing this. They're acting as the art director. And you can say, well, that's what a lot of agencies do or big studios. But there are a lot of designers who don't have an agency or a studio. They just farm out all this work to other people. They have, might have regular contractors they use, but they act as the go-between. And they make a really good living doing this. They go out, they meet with the client, they go through the whole discovery process, they brainstorm ideas, and then they farm out the actual work to willing design contractors, design freelancers, or just find somebody on one of these platforms. Now, of course, the trick here, if you want this plan to work, is to find good designers. Designers who charge you less than what you are charging the clients. Or maybe I should phrase that the other way around and say you need to find clients that are willing to pay you more than what you are paying the designer to do the work for you. Now, I've done this several times myself over the years. Usually with projects that either I didn't want to do, and most of the time they were with existing clients that wanted me to do something that I just didn't really feel like doing, so I would farm it out. Or it was sometimes with projects that I couldn't handle myself. Maybe a client asked me to do something that I wasn't comfortable with. Like I do this anytime that I need PHP. I've talked about it on the podcast before, how I've never got the hang of PHP coding. So anytime I need PHP coding done, I farm that out to somebody else. I don't pass on the project. I, I have in the past, and I kick myself for that because I lost some really good projects when I had the mentality that, oh, if I can't do it, I just turn it down. But once I adapted the, the mentality that just because I can't do it doesn't mean I can't get somebody to do it for me, then I was able to take on some really good projects. And PHP coding is one of those things. Whenever I need it, I farm it out to somebody and I handle the rest of the project. But I can tell you the many times that I have farmed out work in the past have all worked out really well. The client was happy, the designer was happy that they got to do the work, and I was happy acting as the go-between. Now, following this model, the best thing about it is that the client remains yours, even if you're not doing the work yourself. And if in the future, for some reason, you have more time on your hand, maybe you leave your full-time job, in Rihanna's case, and decide to open your business full-time again, you can always take on that work yourself. But either way, whether you decide in the future to take it on yourself or you farm it out to another designer, the client remains yours. You're not passing this client on to somebody else and never seeing them again. And the next time that client needs design work, there's a very, very, very good chance that they will come back to you, even though you're not the one who actually designed it. You're the one they hired. You're the one they dealt with. So they will come back to you. And there are many, many designers who use this method. They'll do whatever work they can, but whenever things get a little overloaded, they don't just pass on the work or turn it down. They find somebody to help them and keep the clients to themselves. So to recap, if you're finding yourself with too much work for the time you have, the first thing you should do is raise your prices. Then instead of turning down work or passing that work along to other designers, 
take those clients on and farm out the design work yourself to somebody capable of handling it for you. Now, do keep in mind that if you do farm out work, you should have some sort of agreement in place with that designer, possibly a contract or an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. I've talked about those before in the podcast. But you need something in place stating that these designers who are doing the work are not allowed to contact the client directly to offer them to work, like leaving you out. Because the last thing you want to do is for the hired help to start poaching the clients from you. But that's actually pretty easily averted with a simple contract and maybe an NDA, as I said. And if you hire them through one of the many online platforms like Upwork or Fiverr or TopTal or that, chances are those platforms already have some sort of agreement in place protecting you in these situations. So you don't even have to worry about it. So there you have it. I hope this answers your question, Rihanna, and anybody else who's in a similar situation where you have so much work coming in that you don't know what to do with it. Myself, uh, I used to just turn it down. I've never been one. I never really passed it on to other designers. I have, I guess, on the odd time, but most of the time I would just turn the work down and let the client go find somebody else on their own. But then I stopped doing that, and now I very rarely will turn work down. I will take it on, and if I can't complete it myself, I will find somebody to help me do it. And that's part of the way that I grew my business. So I hope that Brianna and you listening right now to the podcast have gained some insight on how to handle an overload of incoming work. It's not that difficult. It's not as scary as it sounds, especially if you can hire a designer who charges way less than you it can actually be very, very lucrative for your business and a great way for you to earn extra income beyond the hours that you are actually putting in. So let me ask you a question. Do you ever farm out design work? Let me know. Leave a comment for this episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 230. Now, before I go, I'd like to remind you of the tip of the week, which was inspired by Brian from the Resourceful Designer community, and that's to look over your current expenses and just see where you can cut out a dollar here, a couple of dollars there, or maybe even more. And you may be amazed at how much money you can actually save. And even though it doesn't sound much on a monthly basis, when you add it all up, it can be a good chunk of change come the end of the year. And of course, thank you, Brian, for not cutting out the resourceful designer community. And thank you to everybody who is already a member of the community. I know you're getting so much value out of it because you tell me. And if you're not already a member of the resourceful designer community, why don't you check it out? Visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash community and join today. So that's it for this week. I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best with your design business and reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.